the market this year. And um, I think this is quite an appropriate way to, to end the week, especially with a topic that is so important to Native peoples, but also to museums. And so um, I'd like to welcome you to our session this afternoon, who speaks for the ancestors. Um, we have two extremely distinguished panelists here that I am just delighted to have both of them <laughs> here to share this stage. Um, so I'd like to first of all just uh, introduce these two. Uh, I asked for short, send me a short bio. Uh, short bio for these two is about three pages long. So <laughs> I'm not going to be able to tell you everything about them, but I'll give you just a couple of little, um, a little, uh, not even little, I mean big, big things that these two do. Um, the first person I'd like to introduce is Dr. Suzanne Schoenharjo. Um, I've known Suzanne for a couple of years now and have been delighted to get to know her and a lot of the things that she's involved in. She's a poet, she's a writer, she's a lecturer, curator, and policy advisor and advocate. Um, she's helped numerous Native peoples recover more than a million acres of land, including many sacred places, which I think is really commendable. Um, she also has developed key laws, one of which we're going to talk about today, but key laws in four decades to promote, in the past four decades, to promote and protect Native nations' sovereignty, children, art, children, arts, culture, languages, cultures and languages, including the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, the National Museum of the American Indian Act, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and an executive order on Indian sacred sites. You might recall recently she was the recipient of the 2011 IAIA Honorary Doctorate of Humanities degree, that was this past spring, and she is the first woman to re receive this honor from the Institute of American Indian Arts. Uh, which conferred this tribute only twice before. She was awarded unprecedented back, unprecedented back to back residency fellowships by the School for Advanced Research as the 2004 Dobkin Artist Fellow for Poetry and as a Summer Scholar. She chaired SAR seminars on Native identity and on Native women's cultural matters, and a 2006 seminar on U.S. civilization and Native Identity Policies at the University of Pennsylvania Museum. She, served, she currently serves as the president of the Morning Star Institute and also directs the Native, uh, National Native Rights Organization founded in uh, this, that's what this institution is. I'm getting mixed up here. Uh, she's president of the Morning Star Institute and also directs the National Native Rights Organization founded in 1984 for Native Peoples Traditional and Cultural Advocacy, Arts Promotion and Research. Dr. Harjo is also a leader in cultural rights protection and stereotype busting, and she is one of seven Native people who filed the 1992 landmark case, Harjo et al. versus Pro Football Inc. Um, you know, there's been a lot about this and how um, Native peoples are used and abused for a lot of commercial purposes, for sports teams, and so on. And, um, and Suzanne has been really active in trying to um, turn that around, and she's been very successful. Dr. Harjo is the guest curator and general editor for the National Museum of the American Indian's upcoming exhibit and book, Treaties, Great Nations in Their Own Words, which I think is going to be fantastic. I can't wait to both read the book and see the exhibition. She's also a founder, uh, one of the founding trustees of NMAI in Washington, D.C. And she be began work with a coalition in 1967 that led to the NMAI and to federal repatriation laws reforming museum policies dealing with Native, uh, Native peoples. She is also the founding member of the Working Group for the Disposition of Culturally Identified Human Remains, which we'll talk a little bit about today, too. Um, now, Dr. James Ridingin 
welcome. It's great to have you here today. Um, I just met him just a few minutes ago, so I'm just delighted he was able to join us. Uh, Dr. Writing In is an activist Pawnee scholar who received an AA degree from the Haskell Indian Junior College, now Haskell Indian Nations University, which I just think is wonderful for Haskell. Um, he's a baccalaureate, and he has a baccalaureate in history from Fort Lewis College, just up the road here in Durango, and a master's in American Indian Studies and a doctorate in U.S. History from UCLA. In addition to being the editor, and I know I'm not going to say this right, Wichelso, Wichelso, no, Wichelso, Shaw, Wichelso Shaw. Um, thank you. I knew I would be able to say that. Um, it's a review journal for Native American studies. He is an associate professor and a founder of the American Indian Studies Program at Arizona State University. And uh, he teaches courses dealing with issues ranging from sovereignty and the U.S. courts to struggles over repatriation and sacred sites. Very appropriate background for our discussion today. His research interests transcend traditional academic disciplines and bridge matters of decolonizing methodologies and paradigms, indigenous histories, cultures, resistance, critical race theory, human rights, religious freedom, sacred sites protection, and repatriation. Wow, he's involved in a lot, a lot of areas. Um, all areas that I'm really very interested in. Um, his scholarly works have been published in numerous academic journals and books. He is the co-editor of Native Historians Write Back, Decolonizing American Indian History, which is scheduled for publication in October 2011. He is past president of the American Indian Studies Association and a featured writer of the National Museum of the American Indians Writer Series. Dr. Writing In is also the 2011 recipient of the Cal Sikawa Outstanding ASU Faculty Award for his commitment to leadership development and community building. Working on behalf of Indian nations and peoples, he has participated in grassroots initiatives that have successfully challenged oppressive and unethical curatorial practices in museums. Dr. Writing In played a key role in historic agreements on behalf of the Pawnee Nation with the Smithsonian Institution, University of Nebraska, and the Colorado Historical Society that led to the repatriation and reburial of hundreds of ancestral human remains and funerary objects. He is also a founding member of the working group along with Suzanne, uh, Dr. Harjo, for the disposition of the culturally, of culturally unidentified human remains. In 2008, he was the principal investigator and co-author of a study that examines problems uh, of federal agency implementation of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Having served as, a, as chair of the Board of Trustees of the Pawnee Nation College since its inception in 2005, Dr. Riding In is helping to share the mission, curriculum, and future of this new tribal college. So I would like to um, let's welcome these two incredible speakers today. I'm going to um, prompt them with a few questions, but I have a feeling I don't need to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> these two have um, a lot of experience, but I thought, uh, first of all, maybe um, Maybe a good place to start, since a lot of um, people in the audience probably have some familiarity with uh, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act that was enacted in 1990. We also call it NAGPRA, so um, we'll probably use NAGPRA a lot here, just so you know what the acronym is. Um, this act has um, really turned the museum world, I think, around. Um, and, and made some changes in our policies and how, especially how uh, one we care for ancestral individuals that we have in our collections, but also our relationships I think, with, with Native people. So um, I thought probably the first question would be, why? Why was this law needed? I think that will be a good way to get us started. Thank you for those wonderful eulogies. 
1967 who asked a lot of us to go to Bear Butte, where we were, most of us were already going for ceremonies. And uh, that's a place in South Dakota, Mesa, uh, that is, uh, in the Cheyenne language, it's Namawa's holy mountain. And it's called different things by different nations. And a lot of us uh, have done ceremonies there for a long, long time. And our religious leaders wanted us to stay for four days of talk. Uh, after our ceremonies about several things. And <clears throat> it all comes down to one word, which is respect. They wanted to talk about the return, the preservation and then return and control of some of our sacred places. And that was about our respect for those sacred places and the lack of care and respect that they were getting. And a way for us to gain respect in American society and popular culture, where we were pretty demeaned in, in blatant ways. And remember, this is 1967 is, is uh, a time that's easy for me to remember, uh, harder for, for younger people to, to even know what was going on there. We used to uh, be confronted with, with no Indians or dogs allowed signs in Oklahoma. Um, and I saw those signs in various states, including in Sturgis, which is uh, the town right in South Dakota, right by Bear Butte. So <clears throat> we were mistreated and maltreated in museums and educational institutions. and a lot of our things and people that had been disrupted either in their journeys to afterlife, had, had, had their remains dug up uh, by grave robbers, um, a lot of our living beings, our sacred objects that we still did ceremonies for and with, and they were the central things or the important things in our ceremonies and we talked about them, we knew what they looked like, uh, we didn't have access to them and no one alive. Had even. And so that people have assurance about the things they have. Everyone knows what cultural patrimony is. Ledger books that belong to the Dogmen Society, that's cultural patrimony. Wampum belts, that's cultural patrimony. The wampum belt that depicts George Washington and the five nations of the Haudenosaunee Iroquois Confederacy, their version of the 1794 Canandaigua Treaty is the same thing as what's in the National Archives as the 1794 Canandaigua Treaty. That's an item of cultural patrimony. I can't walk into the National Archives and say, I want that, that belongs to me, or I can sell this to you cheaper than... <laughs> no, because it belongs to all people. So that's what cultural patrimony is, however you define that group. And we were very specific about the kind of the examples, a medicine bundle that belongs to a particular society. That's something that people can identify, even if no one living has seen, has seen it. So these are complicated things for Native people to, to um, repatriate. They're complicated. It's a complicated set of, of criteria. And I think our major failing was on the law enforcement side that didn't deal adequately with the people, with the scoff laws, with the people who were refusing to do inventories, with the people who were engaging in, in uh, criminal activity. So, but you ask any law enforcement person um, who's dealt with these issues for the Interior Department or for the Justice Department or any state entity, and they can even show you pictures of here's, here's violation of, of uh, burial ground X on, in May of such and such a day. I mean, this is going on now. 
So it, it's not a mystery. I just received my black market journal last week. Did you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's called American Indian Art Magazine. <laughs> uh, Sotheby's and uh, who's the other? Christie's, they have a whole section in there that uh, delineates uh, what they've sold and there's even pictures in there. It's cool. Really expensive. <laughs> and a lot of tribes can't, don't get that magazine and they don't have the money to bid on stuff like that. But a lot of that, to me, is pretty questionable. You know, there's some really old pottery that I've seen in there and some uh, war shirts that come from, you know, the little bighorn battleground. I don't think it's that. Same guy. What was the village called? <laughs> that, that sold the stuff to that museum. Anyway, um, there was just recently um, a case that the BLM, Bureau of Land Management, and um, some uh, federal police, FBI, I'm assuming, and uh, other uh, agencies in the Four Corners were working a sting operation for the longest time, and they finally uh, were able to get enough evidence to uh, arrest people and uh, you know file lawsuits and put them in jail. And uh, the sad part about it was that these folks that were doing all the buying and the collecting, a lot of them committed suicide, so they wouldn't have to face justice. And um, despite the fact that, as, you know, as we all pointed out, that this legislation doesn't have much teeth or much enforcement uh, attached to it, uh, there are there have been some efforts, at least. Uh, in specific areas across the country to enforce it. And this was just one of those examples. And, and it, as a matter of fact, the guy that, I guess, what was his name, Leroy McCoy, or I forget what his name is, he writes in that American Indian Art, the Black Market Journal I was talking about, he writes a little section that's called um, Legal, Review, Legal Review. And he's been um, updating his, his opinion about this whole sting operation for the past year in this, in this magazine that comes out I think quarterly. But he's, um, he just recently he wrote that, um, that the, in, in the poll that the BLM is ruining people's lives by enforcing this legislation, enforcing these laws. And, but you know, they knew that and they were going in. They, they, are, they, they were a lot of prominent people that were doctors and, and business people in the Four Corners area that were buying the stuff from um, <clears throat> these pot hunters who, as James Wright rightly described, uh, go in at night. They're usually young people who have been doing this for generations. And they're really sophisticated now. They have GPS. They have uh, the combat night vision goggles, and they, uh, if they can, they will even take a bobcat in there instead of taking the shovels and picks. They'll go in there, and they also employ uh, ground penetrating radar because that's possible now, and they can, they really, um, and they've become really sophisticated in their efforts to uh, loot the graves and um, homes of our ancestors. I know this because uh, when I was an archaeologist, <laughs> which I don't like to admit often, uh, we were working on a site in, in Taos County in, in our ancestral home of Pot Creek. And just down the road from us, Fort Bergwin, who I call the Black Market, I'm just kidding. It's owned by Southern Methodist University. Oh, I hope so many of our wow. alumni of the university. They have a a uh, field school out there, and they uh, get students out there every summer, and they dig in a uh, little pot creek, and actually it's a huge site, it's our ancestral home, and they've been doing that for many years, and, um, but there's other areas in, in that valley that um, are not owned by um, SMU or private ownership, but by the Forest Service and BLM, and those are the places where where um, 
grave robbing is still going on. And we know that because we would often, you know, on our days off or lunch breaks or in late in the evening, we'd go over there and we'd go, you know, the archaeologists I was working for and also the Forest Service archaeologists would come out and we'd go, hey, let's go see what they've dug up today. And it was amazing. And they did it in the cover of night. And they knew specifically where to go to. They do their research. You know, they go to the, the library or historical society uh, museum or archives uh, online. You know, they have to. They, they do their research well. And sometimes even better than the archaeologists themselves. Yes, in addition to the issues about the repatriation that you've described, you started out by talking about the general concept of respect. Has that changed uh, uh, really substantially since 1967, and has this law had an impact on that? The, just the general concept. Yes, it is my view. Um, the we have a place at the table. When, and that's the main thing that, that the repatriation laws, the repatriation laws, and then the repatriation policy of the National Museum of the American Indian. So you're dealing with three separate processes that now have become mostly merged. They all provide for Native American people to be at the decision making at the negotiating table at the, um, as part of the process. And for our human rights and human dignity in these areas uh, of, of religion and custom and tribal law and treaties to be respected. So that's as much as you can do in a piece of legislation. And because, it, and one reason it was important to change the lexicon was toward this, this, this area of respect that if you forced in the legal process people to stop using terms that insulted the native people, that that would eventually become the way people talked about these areas. And would in and of itself create a bit of respect because it um, you would constantly be bristling because someone is insulting all your people, all your world view, all your way of life, everything that you've been taught to respect um, from, from the time you were a child. Um, so you don't hear that barrage of insults in the, in the formal official proceedings. Now, the way people are disrespectful about us can still continues outside those official um, ways, but you can see in, in curatorial processes, you can see in um, the ways that the entities that have our people and, and things um, have learned from us. I mean, they've learned a lot through they didn't know what they had, first of all. I mean, the inventories did the, the entities more um, good than it did the repatriation effort good, because the inventories forced uh, the, the uh, federal and federally assisted educational institutions, agencies, historical societies, to look at what they had and, and really look at it. And so you've had a lot of, um, um, and, and then to send out archival inventories, not massive inventories, just something that promoted early interaction with Native peoples. So you had these archival inventories saying, uh, dear Pueblo, dear tribe, dear nation, uh, we have some of your things, maybe, in our collection. Maybe they're people, maybe they fall under sacred objects. You know, come see us. 
And so then, you know, it was up to the people to go to the entities to see what was there. Through that, and that, that's not the formal inventory process, the lengthy one. That's the archival relationship in the process. So just that engendered a lot of respect. Um, because you had people saying, do you know what you have here? <laughs> or we know exactly whose pipe this is. This is, or this is what we've been looking for. This particular buffalo skull was we were we've been looking for, and my great grandfather painted it. I mean, they're very specific things and holy cow kinds of things uh, for the for the um, museums and the people. So you're bringing in the process the people who care most about what's in the collection. That's respect, right there. And it, can, it had been acrimonious, it had been disrespectful in a lot of instances. And now there was a, a federal law with subpoena power and all of that that helped it along. But eventually it has worked out to, um, to be a very respectful process. And I haven't, there, there are very few entities and that have uh, actually gone through the process that have a lot of complaints. You have a lot of good suggestions, but not a lot of complaints. And in society, the education process has taken over from the, the federal and federally assisted entities that are in the business of educating the public, of sharing with the public. And that's, that's creating a whole other level of interest and respect. So that's the way I see it. Yeah, um, th I think we have changed the attitudes of many of these institutions and the people working in them. We've had some real good friends in these uh, museums. Uh, one example, a repatriation I was involved in was at the University of Colorado, you know, Colorado Museum. system and um, they called a meeting and it, uh, of all the tribes that had a connection with this part of Nebraska and uh, agreed to uh, culturally affiliate all those remains with uh, all those tribes so we did we bury all that way so we seen that happen and uh, and uh, that museum and to my knowledge is, is uh, through that process repatriated all those remains that uh, from that area so that's what we want to see is getting all these ancestors back and but uh, on the other side, though, we still see these institutions that are still committed to um, maintaining the old colonial uh, status quo, where they have control over these ancestors and are not going to give them back. And, uh, and there's even examples where uh, uh, universities uh, have allowed uh, um, uh, uh, people uh, who call themselves scientists to uh, 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 conduct a DNA test a destructive analysis in opposition to the uh, to the wishes of Indian people, and uh, um, so this is going on also, and, uh, and I think this is part of the reason uh, that only uh, four of all these ancestral remains have been repatriated is because of the opposition that continues to exist in these institutions. So we still have a long ways to go in terms of building this respect. And I agree with Suzanne uh, also, but uh, you know we've got a long ways to go yet. It's true that it is, it is built with respect, especially, uh, as my colleague said, among uh, the museums that have larger collections, um, except for the Smithsonian. How come they're exempt? Except for that. I'm just kidding. Um, but um, especially here in New Mexico, we've had a lot of cooperation from uh, the museums of New Mexico, and uh, the Western uh, Museum in Silver City and uh, the um, National Monuments in the area like um, Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon, they've, they've been really uh, cooperative and um, it's uh, good to see that but there's also uh, 
lot of museums like the Field and the Essex, the Peabody Essex, and uh, places like that who have really extensive collections. And they're a little bit harder to work with, but uh, for the most part, that's because they have the advantage of geographic location on their site. Mm -hmm. But uh, like I said earlier, as, as uh, tribes get more and more funding, or access to funding, uh, we'll be sending out delegations to those places as well. You, you correctly pointed, it's pointed out that you've had, I believe you pointed out, that you've had very little help from the federal government uh, in dealing with these issues. You also correctly pointed out that two of the people in the uh, Four Corners sting operation committed suicide. Uh, I wonder why you think the FBI informant committed suicide. If anybody has an opinion about that, because he did. I think it's very dangerous business to be involved in, and that if any time you're involved in that kind of illegal activity, that it's dangerous for its own reasons because you have people who don't respect the law. And you're dealing with pretty nasty characters. Uh, you're dealing with people who are mercenaries and who um, don't have any deeper value than the money. Um, so there, I, I have no idea why um, why these particular people committed suicide. It's uh, I just think it's dangerous business and a lot of our a lot of native people are not involved in any aspect of repatriation because of that because it, we're, we're told that it's very dangerous just to be around um, just to be around these topics even not not just the people and the thing, because you don't know what has gone into uh, you don't know what that set of human remains has gone through you don't know what that ancestor has gone through uh, you don't know uh, we're, we're finding that what was once considered good museum practice to keep pests away uh, using arsenic and other poisons is now making it impossible for people to use particular masks or items that they put on themselves for ceremonies once those items are repatriated. So this is exposing lots and lots of misguided um, human error, misguided practices from the past, um, lots of superstitions uh, that the Europeans and the European Americans brought with them uh, about us um, it, that enabled this massive confiscation of, of um, materials from living Native peoples who were just trying to do ceremonies. Uh, so there, there are lots of things that are that are involved here, and the people on our side of the, the table, if you will, it are very few who work in this area. I mean, I've never participated in a repatriation, for example, because I, I do policy and work in that area, but I take my guidance from the people who do that hard and dangerous work. Now, if you're at least our people are protected in their mission and in their work by, by medicines, by ceremonies, because they're doing a good thing. If they were just doing what they're doing for mercenary reasons or um, to, to get something for free to sell to someone for profit, what kind of people would they be? What kind of people would they what kind of danger are they putting themselves in? So I, I think this is, uh, has to be seen in a, in a huge context and 
that you never know why people uh, do definitive things to themselves, but there are lots of reasons that they might. probably also feared that unwritten law of, of the criminal justice system. He was going to go into prison as a snitch, if he went to prison at all. And plus, um, it's, uh, I think he had a heavy emotional burden. I mean, a lot of those people were his friends too. I mean, associates, people that he knew on a daily basis. You know, that's you know, the human mind and ethic is, you know, can be full of guilt. And if, you know, as Suzanne said, you know, there's a lot of other things that go into the emotions of a person. Um, I think our culture has mechanisms, as Suzanne pointed out, that we can uh, sort of attempt to right the wrongs. And um, the repatriation is a very uh, sensitive issue, even for our <clears throat> our own people. Uh, I've worked on a few, but it's not. <clears throat> you feel rewarded, but you don't feel satisfied. You, you actually feel. Uh, I, I felt perplexed. It's, how it could have gotten to that point. Um, I was also, in one case, very angered because uh, we were re-interring some remains and uh, a staff member from the uh, archaeological department with the state was on site with us. And she went and threw in a piece of metal so that she later, as she later told me, she could, could you could relocate that burial. And that kind of pissed me off and she, although she wasn't a friend and um, I had some respect for her but I lost it that day because of what she did. 